This meeting is now being live streamed. This is Value After Hours. I'm Tobias Carlyle, joined as always by my co-host, Jake Taylor. Our special guest today is Jim Carroll. He is with Ballast Rock Private Wealth. He's a senior wealth advisor and portfolio manager. He's the Vixologist <laughs> on Twitter. How are you, Jim? Good to see you. I'm very well. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome, Jim. Jim, um, you sent me through. You've got a. You did a review of what happened in the VIX and volatility last year. Let's let's start there. Why don't we just start off sure. at a very rudimentary level? Let's talk about first what volatility VIX is, and then let let's proceed into it from there. If you don't mind. Sure. No, not at all. Um, so, VIX is a measure of S and P five hundred implied volatility going out 30 days. So it's looking out 30 days into the future. And it's essentially taking a strip of S&P 500 index options, both puts and calls, and uh, measuring the implied volatility of those options and then collapsing that into one number for VIX. And, you know, the what, what people... Uh, Colloquially, colloquially know about VIX is that it is the fear index, right? VIX jumps when things get bad. Um, and VIX tends to drop when things are calm. Um, it's a little more nuanced than that. Uh, th there's kind of an ecosystem that has been built up around VIX. VIX goes back to about 1993. It's gone through a couple of computation changes to uh, kind of keep up with the modern world. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, what, what people think about when they think about VIX is, is fear and, you know, what's happening in the market. Is it, is it calm? Is everything okay? Or is it agitated? And, you know, things are uh, uh, maybe upside down. It's, it's become even more complicated over time because, you know, somebody said, well, gee, you know, if we have a 30 day measure of implied volatility, why don't we have a 60 day measure of implied volatility? Why don't we go out three months and six months and a year um, and you can actually create a term structure of volatility from these different SIBO indices? Um, and now we've gone all the way down to zero because obviously zero day to expiration options are you know, all the rage these days. Um, so we've created this ecosystem and, and, and another part of that, another important part of that going back to 2004 was the introduction of VIX futures. Um, so we have uh, an array of VIX futures um, and, and then VIX options that actually trade to the futures, not to the spot index. So um, there's a lot to get confused about, and and people are routinely confused about you know what to do with these things, and you know why is this one going one direction and that one's going a different direction, and uh, so so it makes life fun for me on Twitter because I can jump in and try to confuse people even more. <laughs> hey, Jim, so the, does a zero day does that? Uh, you know, we've heard about how that has this gamma issues that for regular stocks, but does that do anything to the VIX side as well? Uh, well, like there's been a lot of, that... yeah, there, there's been a lot of um, back and forth on that in the VIX world, you know, VIX vol twit, if you will. Um, because if you that think about it, uh, if if you're managing a portfolio and one of the things you do is you use options to either hedge the portfolio or maybe, you know, one of the hot topics these days is whether some people are out there using call options as stock replacement, right? I don't want to own in NVIDIA anymore, but I don't want to lose my exposure to it. So I'll sell my underlying stock, but I'm going to buy some call options. So if it keeps going, I can participate. Um and with the, you know, you go back and there were monthly option expirations. And then they said, gee, well, if monthly's good, weekly's got to be better. 
And so, you know, the big indices got weekly options and eventually some of the big single stocks got weekly options. Well, if weekly options are good, <laughs> so then you had uh, every other day in S&P and now we've got every day. So every day is a, is a zero data expiration option opportunity. And if you think about it, you say, well, gee, you know, it used to be that if I wanted to hedge against some known event on the calendar, I'd have to go out past it and, you know, express my hedge, you know, out 30 days or, or more. And now I can say, OK, boom, next Tuesday, you know, I'm hedged. Uh, and so the question really becomes, are some of these flows coming down into the shorter expiry periods and is it sucking uh activity out of you know the 30-day vix calculation you know is vix broken oh let's go through that again um and and i would argue that you know vix ain't broken it's it's as you know either useful or useless as it's ever been um the the options out there still trade uh people still uh, use it as a you know measure of what's going on with implied volatility relative to realized volatility and relative to other things. Um, but clearly, the activity at the front end of the expiry structure uh, is is a different thing. It's a new thing, and uh, clearly, it's having impact. Really, at least so far, more on a day to day basis than you know. In, in the bigger picture of where things are going to go three or six months from now. Because dealers obviously have to uh, be in the market. They, they're they buying and selling these things. And, and you know, if you listen to uh, the experts who are, you know, in the pits dealing with this stuff, the only way to hedge as a dealer, the only way to hedge zero DTE is with zero DTE. <laughs> so they're so, getting long or short. Based on they're, what they're, they're, they're getting exposures. long or short those options based on, you know, flows that are coming to them. Um, and, uh, you know, so one of the concerns was, gee, you know, if the dealers are hedging against these options, if, if you go out to a 30 day option and a dealer sells you a call or sells you a put, you know, then they're short that exposure and they will go. Uh, uh, hedge themselves typically in the underlying, either in the futures or in the cash. And uh, so, you know, periodically there will be circumstances where there can be a big chunk of option that is going to expire and the dealers need to unwind whatever their hedge was. And that can lead to either buying or selling of the underlying in a way that can potentially move the market. Um, that, by you know from from every expert i know um they they don't really have the ability to do that zero dte you know today's expiry and so to the extent that they're hedging they're hedging with other zero dte and kind of canceling out some of the noise although you know every once in a while we get one of these days where you look at the price action and you say well <clears throat> you know I go back to the days when all that shit was happening on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And, you know, you went to Joe and you traded with Joe. Well, obviously, Joe's been replaced by a computer because some of the price actions you see these days is just inexplicable, except for algorithms, you know, trying to beat the crap out of each other. Do you feel like it's had any impact on the underlying prices or is is, is the tail wagging the dog or is it is that? It hasn't been around for long enough. We're just looking at a market that's sort of done one thing since they've come in. You know, I, I, I yeah, we don't really know yet. Um, uh, I tend to believe that, you know, the derivative tail, uh, as it has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, I live in a part of the country where we have a lot of alligators around. <laughs> and the one thing you don't ever want to do is get hit by the tail of an alligator. You know, it's it, it can be as destructive as their teeth. <laughs> and uh, I can't help but believe that, you know, we're kind of creating uh, this this Frankenstein monster of option flows that, 
you know, will wag the dog at some point in time. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if you're hedging with zero, one, two, three, four day to expiry options and some tsunami comes in, you know, you got to get further out on the expiry on the term structure to hedge, you know, a, a big event. And so, you know, what some people are concerned about is that what we're going to see is whenever this unknown unknown becomes known, um, there's going to be, you know, a giant flood of action out to 30 days and three months and wh whatever, you know, time frame people think they need in order to protect themselves. And you could see, you know, VIX and other measures of implied volatility just kind of go through the roof again. Let me just give a shout out to the listeners and then let's come back and talk about what happened in uh, volatility last year. So Peter Tikva, Israel, what's up? Always first in the house. San Diego, Valparaiso, Nashville, Dead Cat Gully, New South Wales. You and me both, brother. Menomonee Falls, Wisconsin, Santa Monica, Castleford, England. Santa Domingo, Dominican Republic, at Milton Keynes. Uh, Mosfels Bar, Iceland, sorry. Oh, there's another one here. Some bangers in here. JT. Found it out, Toby. Tromsø, Norway. Who are these people? Bangalore, India. Beverly. Ah. <laughs> Netherlands, good one. Tallahassee, Kansas City, Kennesaw, Vancouver, Durham, London, Jupiter, Old Ocean, Harrington. What's up? Brandon, Mississippi. Jim, you said we were a little bit subdued last year in volatility. You know, I, I, uh, in I your presentation. It, yeah, I referred to it in the presentation that the, the, Title page uh, said nothing burger. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if you look back at what happened last year, um, once we got through the little March meltdown with the regional banks, with SVB and First Republic and such, um, there really just wasn't a lot going on and, you know, kind of dubbed it the year of no fear. Um, we had... Uh, VIX get back to levels that we hadn't seen since before COVID, right? So kind of uh, three plus year lows, um, realized volatility in the S&P, very low. Um, you know, some of the highlights, number of days that VIX was above 20, you know, was tiny compared to the last three years. We hadn't seen that kind of stuff since uh, 2019, really. Um, I think the S&P had plus or minus 2%, you know, twice <laughs> last year. Uh, so there just really wasn't anything going on. One of the other things, um, you know, if you go back to 2022, which was a year when everybody was just really pissed off at the VIX, Right. Because you had stocks going down, you had bonds going down and hedges didn't work for a damn. Um, yeah, what happened there? Like, what's what's your well, diagnosis you know, if, of if, that? So so let me put it as simply as possible. Right. Um, if you have a straight line that goes from lower left to upper right, that's your perfect investment. And it has zero volatility. If you have a straight line that goes from upper left to lower right, you've lost all your money with zero volatility. And what really happened in 2022 was you had market moves that really were just kind of stepwise. And so you really never had the kind of uh, violence that would cause implied volatility to, to jump. You, you, you just had this steady grind lower, this low volatility demolishing <laughs> the value of your portfolio, whether you own <laughs> stocks or bonds. But, you know, it was like, okay, every day we're going down 1%. And so where's the volatility, you know, in VIX and, and, you know, the vol instruments uh, don't behave well in those environments. Uh, you know, if you look at some of the tail hedge ETFs uh, that were out, um, I, I like to look at a couple of indices that the SIBO has. One is a put protection index, 
where you own the S and P and you, and you're, you know, buying put protection. The other one is you own the S and P and you're buying VIX calls. And in 2022, those were terrible. They didn't do anything for you. You just were burning option premium. And in 2023, they really didn't do anything for you either. You know, you, you, we did have some declines in 2023 in the market, right into the fall. Um, and, but, you know, again, the declines were of the nature where there just wasn't enough fear to cause those premiums to pay off. Jim, it seems like um, is the sort of implicit Fed put uh, seems like would be a pretty big finger on the scale of, of this. Like, I mean, everyone knows the Fed has their back. So, like, what do I need to, like, insure myself against? Like, the Fed will insure for me. Well, and and. I think that's the attitude that a lot of people have is, you know, that the Fed is going to, if we go back to Bernanke, you know, subprime is contained. <laughs> uh, you know, the Fed is working to contain this, whether it's through the rescue of, you know, the, the uh, uh, regional banks back in the spring of last year, uh, whether it's uh, trying to walk the tightrope of, you know, what's next for interest rates. Um, lots of jawboning going on. Um, you know, we'll see. I think, you know, the market still thinks that the right path is for the Fed to cut rates. Um, it's looking less and less likely that, you know, we, we sure ain't going to get six this year. Are we going to get five, four, three, two, one? I don't know. Um, do they typically cut when? The stock market's at an all-time high and unemployment's at an all-time <laughs> low. Is that is that usually the way they do it? Well, if you look back and, you know. Don't forget trillion-dollar deficits on top of that. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you look back in time, and obviously it's a small data sample because, you know, the Fed's only been around for 100 right. years or so. and um, But – when the Fed cuts rates, it's typically because uh, the economy needs relief. And it tends to be too late for the stock market. Um, you know, if you go back to global financial crisis, if you go back to, you know, the Internet collapse, if you go back to any time the Fed has cut rates, you know, it's typically uh, in concert with the stock market going down. Um, horse has already left the barn. Yeah, the horse has already <laughs> left the barn. Um, and and they're, you know, it's it's like if you look at a chart of, you know, Fed funds rate versus, you know, the two year or something like that. You know, the, the, the two year tells you what direction we're going in and then the Fed catches up. Um, so, you know, all of these people hollering for the Fed to start cutting rates, you know, it's it's one of those. Be careful. You might not want what you're asking for. Um, because if the economy is strong, which it appears to be, uh, if inflation is not, you know, ha hasn't, if that dragon has not been slain, um, then they're going to conclude that they can't cut rates yet. Um, so, you know, higher for longer, at least in some form, uh, shouldn't surprise people, but, you know, people like to be surprised, I guess. Often the term structure has some unusual characteristics about it. So I haven't looked for a little while, but historically when there's an election coming up, there's often a little bump around the election. Is that the case this year? Uh, there's a huge bump uh, right now, actually. Let me see if I can pull it up. Um, yeah, October futures came on the board not that long ago. Right now, and October futures, October VIX futures, you know, look out 30 days. So they're looking out beyond the November election. And right now the September contract is quoted 1755 and the October contract is 20. Right. You know, so that's, you know, like a two and a half point premium uh, between September and October. So the VIX futures are saying something's going to happen and it's going to, you know, cause some turmoil um who knows you know what's baked into that but uh 
if you want to buy that kind of insurance and, you know, VIX futures are in, in some respects a, an insurance contract, uh, you got to pay up for it. Is 20, 20 is about historical average. 20 is, you know, again, 20 is, is relative to, to 17 and a half, 20 is high, but in the, in the, you know, in terms of history, you know, 20 is not crazy. Um, right now, the front end is at about 14. You know, we've seen it lower. You go back to 2017, you know, when we saw spot VIX get below 10 a bunch of times. But that was, you know, the anomaly of our lifetimes, probably. <laughs> Hold down the thumb, Jim. Uh, well, you know, look, I, it, n nothing would please me more than to have 2017 come back again. Uh, because uh, uh, it was a good year. Let's just put it that way. How many times can we cut taxes? <laughs> I, I can't talk. I can't talk about performance, but it was a good year um, to be a volatility Which, trader. You, you, Jim, you just had I've, to. Sorry. Go ahead, Jake. Uh, something I've wondered about with the, the tail risk products. I find the math actually rather compelling as far as the limiting your downside. The variance, that variance drain as you fall off the cliff, um, and how hard it is to get back once you do, um, and then the you know Shannon's demon arguments, all those things. Like I think it's like it's very compelling. But what I always it's a little hard for me to wrap my mind around is when you're buying the premium for it, like you're paying this premium. Like why wouldn't that be so expensive as to basically neutralize the uh, like how I guess I'm I'm asking like how properly priced are the premiums uh, in in the insurance uh, world, well, they're they're, you know, it's it's a uh, it's really kind of a seller's market, um, and so you know, uh, I, I think the easiest way to uh, gauge the challenges associated with you know a tail hedging strategy is to just pull up a chart of VXX. Um, and watch it go from upper left to lower right, you know, and, and, uh, whether it's on a log scale or a regular, you know, it's just what, what the heck, why would anybody ever buy that thing? Um, and, so and that's free money what, basically up to the other side. Well, it's, it's free money to be short, except, you know, if you were short that, you know, uh, uh, going into, you know, any one of a number of episodes, the most recent being COVID, you know, you would have been carried out. Uh, and so, you know, I've always found it a little um, confusing, is a polite word, uh, that folks in my little pond of volatility traders tend to be on one side or the other, you know, short vol or long vol. Um, and, you know, short vol is picking up, you know, dimes in front of the steamroller and, you know, uh, you're going to get killed in Valmageddon or, you know, um, and long vol, you're just going to bleed to death before you ever get paid. <laughs> and uh, there obviously are folks out there who um, have spent time trying to figure out you know, how you cut that bleed or how you can be short and avoid the catastrophe. Um, and, you know, and some of us are dumb enough to try to take both sides of the trade, you know, but nobody can time markets. So I must be an idiot. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, if you take kind of a short term trader, swing trader perspective, with some of these instruments, which most people can't do. They either don't know how or don't have the, uh, uh, the constitution <laughs> or, or the focus. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, uh, there are some ways to play both sides. And I think playing both sides in some fashion is the only way that you have a chance to get the long exposure when you need it without bleeding to death. That, you've got to you, you've got to take both sides somehow. That Taleb Spitznagel style of thing seems to be sell the near your money, buy the buy the tails. That that's sort of the 
Right. Has that has that worked? I mean, is that a is that a viable strategy and implementation? Well, you know, um, Universa, um, they've done fine. Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of institutional money managers, you know, think endowments, pension funds, you know, big Goliath organizations that uh, that might want, you know, a head strategy that's managed by somebody else professionally. And so they might put some money with Universa. Um, you know, I think it was CalPERS who famously got out of it just before COVID. <laughs> yeah, whatever um, they're doing, you probably want to think about it. You want to do the opposite, <laughs> <laughs> you know the the and and the challenge, you know, and and it was funny because Universe obviously put up some great numbers, you know, in COVID, and and it was like they made four trillion percent, um, <laughs> but you know, but when you in actually look at yeah, He's when, a goat when farmer you actually, too. they should mention yeah, when, that. when when you actually look at what the you know notional exposure was and and what the sort of real impact on a portfolio, I mean, it was nice. Um, and and so I have nothing you know negative to say about Spitznagel and Universa, and uh, it's it's a strategy that you know has validity. Um, you know, I it's think what really Mark would question. say as a, a counter argument to that was you have to look at the blend of both, let's say, ninety eight percent long S and P five hundred and two percent mm-hmm. hedged, and that the there's some magic that happens between the combination of those, and so just taking it in isolation is not really not a fair right. assessment. No, it's not. It's not a fair in either direction, either the either bleed direction. or or the positive impact of of having the long vol exposure, the convexity, uh, and I think that's absolutely right. So you know, then it's um, you know what what is the impact on the overall portfolio of having a one percent or a two percent or a X percent you know exposure to that particular strategy? Is that going to get you what you what you want when that stuff happens? Um, and, you know, for again, for institutional players who are just trying to avoid really bad stuff happening um, and, and who generally are short vol in their portfolios, you know, they own stocks, they own bonds, they own whatever they own, real estate, uh, you know, they're uh, short vol, short vol, short vol. <laughs> they, they probably should have something like that as part of their portfolio, just to give them a little bit of a breath of, you know, air when things get really bad. When you look at fixes below 20, which is sort of below average, um, does that, is it, do you think about it like a mean reverting type strategy or is it a thing that has momentum? Like how do you, what's the, you say you're swing trading. Is that sort of suggesting that it's got some short-term momentum characteristics? You, like when it's yeah. cheap, it stays cheap. When it gets expensive, it gets more expensive. Yeah. And, um, you know, I look at VIX. VIX is, is nice, um, but you can't buy or sell VIX, right? So what you're really... Um, yeah. And, and again, there are, there are a thousand ways to express a view of volatility, you know, option markets, futures markets, um, you know, index options, VIX options, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, I think that um, if you think about it this way, most of the time uh, things are on an even keel and you would prefer to be short volatility. Owning stocks, you know, uh, is going the right direction. And that means that shorting VIX futures will, you know, go the right direction. You know, you, you, if, if spots at 14 and the futures are at 16 and you sell the future and, you know, when it expires, it expires at 14, you know, you've collected that two bucks and, you do it again. You now, is that that hot, feet. hot new ETF XIV? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, that's exactly right. And okay. and and my friends have replicated it with SVIX, uh, a better construction, a little more durable, um, and actually uh, has a, a a little bit of a hedge built into it. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, so most of the time being short volatility in one form or another, um, you know, works. And uh, the thing about doing it in this fixed futures 
space is, you know, it's it's kind of like buying a leveraged ETF, right? So you could buy the Qs or you could buy the 2XQs or the 3XQs. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Let's go. And, you know, and there's some volatility associated with doing that. Uh, you know, but if if everything stays going in the right direction, you come out ahead. Um, and so, you know, shorting volatility through the VIX futures is really akin to that. Um, you know, you're getting a multiplier effect versus, you know, owning the sort of underlying plain vanilla indices. And so, you know, you could look at it and say, I don't want 100 percent of my portfolio doing that. But maybe, you know, as a as a little uh, uh, juicer, uh, you know, you, you take some short volatility exposure. Um, but, you know, when the thing falls off the edge of the table and heads to the floor, um, you're heading to the floor, you know, much faster than the S&P or the Qs. And so, you know, you either have to be position sized to deal with that, right? You got 2% of your money in Universa, not 20%. Um, or you have to have a switch that says, okay, I don't like the current condition of this market. You know, I've got my little signals that tell me it's safe or it's not safe. And if it if the signals say it's not safe, then you get out of the position. And, uh, you know, so again, there are a whole bunch of different ways you could conjure that up. But, you know, I would contend uh, that most of the big surprises uh, that we've seen in our lifetimes, you know, have not been as surprising as, you know, people want to portray them. And that includes like the 87 crash. It includes COVID. It includes, you know, uh, August of 2011, August of 2015. Did uh, you know COVID was going to happen before? Yeah. Well, was you it, didn't. Know, there, there was an inversion. Didn't... There was an inversion. No. Yeah. You did. Ten three inverted. Did... That's how you would know. <laughs> well, you know, look, you, you, none of us knew much of anything, you know. But if you were reading, if you were paying attention, and you know, and and, and I can go back and you know show you a little breadcrumbs that said, you know, which side do you want to be on? <laughs> Do you want to be on the side that says everything's okay, full speed ahead? Or do you want to be on the side that says, hey, you know, maybe we should just take a beat here. And how you express that, again, is, you know, everybody's different. Some people would say, I'm just, okay, I'm going to put a little hedge on, or I'm going to take some exposure off. And other people would say, get to the other side of the boat. You know, we are loading up. <laughs> And, you know, if this thing goes the way I think it's going to go, we're going to make, you know, 10 years worth of money in a month. Um, and and some people did that. Uh, Jim, we usually do veggies, uh, which is Jake's. Jake's got some learnings for us, brought to us from the Sacramento International Airport today. So it'll be a little bit of background noise. But uh, yeah, then we'll, when we come back, we'll get some predictions from you. Since <laughs> since COVID was predict was predictable, let's let's uh, let's predict the next thing. Yeah. So so uh, this week's veggies are about this book by it's a short little missive from Jim Collins called "Turning the Flywheel," um, and there in it he has this thing called Bergelman's Trap, which we'll get into. But um, just talking about flywheels more generally, they're these mechanical devices which store energy in the form of rotational momentum. And it, it works because of a principle called the conservation of angular momentum. You can take it to physics classes. Um, but basically, like torque can be applied to a flywheel to cause it to spin, and it increases its momentum. And this stored momentum can be used to apply torque to any rotating object. So most usually, like in machinery or motor vehicles. Um, and a flywheel inherently smooths out these small deviations in the power output of a system. Uh, so the, the stored energy inside of it can like donate if there's a drop in the power input, and conversely, it'll, it can absorb excess power that, that's being generated um, in the form of rotational energy. So uh, interesting that ones made out of steel are generally limited to a max rate of a few thousand RPMs, uh, but they have these high energy density flywheels that are they're made of carbon fiber composites and actually use like magnetic bearings, less friction, and uh, 
it allows them to revolve at speeds up to 60,000 RPMs, which is kind of cool. Um, I mean, flywheels have been around forever in the form of like spindles and potter's wheels, um, you know, 3,500 years ago, um, or sorry, 3,500 BC, uh, they had a rudimentary potter's wheels. Um, so this, this idea of like moment of inertia is another physics term, and it plays the same role as kind of in rotational kinetics as as like mass plays in a linear uh, world. So they both characterize a resistance to change, right? Like it, it's resisting you doing something to it. Um, sometimes you want a high moment of inertia. Um, so like for instance, a tightrope walker, they use this long rod as a balance and it's because it has a very high moment of inertia. Like it, it takes a lot of energy to like make it move rotationally. And so then it provides this, it resists rotation, which gives the walker balance. And that's why they're able to like kind of keep their balance better as they're walking across the tightrope. Sometimes you want a low moment of inertia and if, to improve maneuverability, combat aircraft are designed to have, min to minimize their moment of inertia. This is what a lot of the work of like John Boyd was centered on. Um, and I know Tony, you've sent me some stuff on that, which is really interesting. Um, so back to this book about flywheels in the business context. Um, and, and Collins is, is saying that like basically every good business has some flywheel to it that, that gathers momentum as it's spinning, as, it, as it, the business gets spun up um, and what he calls like strategic compounding. Um, and so, of course, like Amazon is kind of like everyone has heard this one is probably the most widely discussed. But here's a rough sketch of Amazon's flywheel. You start with lower prices on more offerings, which then increases customer visits, which then attracts more third party sellers which then expands the store's offerings, which then grows revenue per fixed cost, which then allows them to lower prices. And then we start the whole flywheel over again. So you're, you're feeding energy into each one of these things, each component, and it's getting the spinning faster and faster. Um, one way of thinking, like you should be able to say at the end of each little consequence, like you almost can't help but. Um, so for instance, like Vanguard has a flywheel that they've been turning now for almost 50 years. They offer low cost mutual funds, which you almost can't help but deliver good long term returns, which you almost can't help but build customer loyalty, which you almost can't help but grow AUM, which you almost can't help but create economies of scale, which you almost can't help but lower costs, right? So we're back up to the top of the flywheel again. And so this thing just is spinning. Um, and so companies that have survived for a long time often have to discover new, new flywheels to build along with the ones that they have going. Um, of course, everyone knows Amazon and, and going having both AWS and retail operations. Uh, but there's lots of other examples like 3M, they added adhesives like scotch tape to their abrasives like sandpaper, uh, Apple PC to the iPhone. Um, Merck actually started out as a chemical company and ended up going into pharmaceuticals. Uh, Disney started with animated films and ended up in theme parks and merchandise. And then maybe one that's interesting, a lot of people haven't heard, but like Circuit City, which was sort of like a poster child for bankruptcy and, you know, a shitty business uh, eventually. Um, they actually created CarMax before going bust and they applied all the same things that they understood about Circuit City to, to selling cars. And that's where CarMax evolved from. Um, so this brings us into what I teased at the beginning, this thing called Bergelman's Trap. And Robert Bergelman was a Stanford Business School professor. And he observed that the greatest danger in business in life lies not in outright failure, but in achieving success without understanding why you were successful in the first place, right? So if you're kind of right for the wrong reasons, that's like the worst case scenario. Um, and it's quite likely that if you can't explain the flywheel of a company that you believe is a superior business that you're investing in, you, you might not understand it well enough to, to consider it within your certain competence and you're therefore following into Bergelman's trap. So. A um, little section on, on flywheels that you can look for and uh, hopefully helps deepen your understanding a little bit of like why some businesses are, are grow to be so dominant. Oh, that was brilliant. Thank you. Right out, Jim. Uh, you're How back do in I the book. follow that? <laughs> Very easily. <laughs> We're going to do some predictions now. What, when you now, uh, when you look I've out, got, now I've got flywheels in my head the rest of the day. I got to look for my flywheel. When you look out at the uh, the vol or just generally, what do you what do you see? What, what does it look like to you now? So I think the um, you know I, I think about all the stuff 
that could have an impact on markets. Um, you know, we've we've been at, had this war in Ukraine for two years now. Um, we've got you know international intrigue in the Middle East and the Far East, and uh, this election coming up. Uh, I, I think the one thing that I feel confident about is that that October VIX futures contract is wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's either way too cheap or way too expensive. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and I don't know, and I'm not taking any bets at the moment. Um, but, you know, I've kind of got one eye attached to that saying, you know, at some point between here and there, um, we're going to be fed some additional information that's going to suggest that you either need to strap your helmet on uh, or, or you need to, you know, increase your equity exposure. Um, I mean, you know, Jim, AI, AI can solve all that. VIX is going to nine. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, we, we didn't talk about it. We didn't talk about AI with zero DTE. <laughs> is it trading zero DTE? <laughs> I'm what sure. Video is. I, I, you know, look, we've we've got algorithmic trading, you know, doing everything, uh, and and I keep getting pitched, you know, on how algorithms are going to solve all my problems, um, but uh, I. I uh, I uh, subscribe to one of Jim O'Shaughnessy's favorite views, which is that the last frontier of arbitrage is human misbehavior. Uh, and I changed from being an econ major to a psychology major after the econ guy said, assume rational behavior. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those, those should be the same degree, really. But unfortunately, they're not. <laughs> Well, you know, more more so than they were back in the day. That's true. Um, we have but, behavioral uh, economics now. Yeah, but um, you know, so I, I guess I would be a bit surprised if uh, this is another nothing burger year in the vol space. Um, but it's possible, and and you know, again, I, I've got my eyes on that October contract to as, as the tell. You know, uh, and obviously we're going to get some news items between here and there. Um, uh, <laughs> we're going to have a couple of, of a couple of political conventions, a couple of. of <laughs> so. I was kind of surprised to see Buffett say that he thought that today's markets were more of a casino than when he was first started out. Well. <sighs> I think um, that's interesting. Um, I would say that, you know, it's it's a little bit like um, sports betting, right? Um, you know, you can now bet in the middle of a game on, you know, the next play. You know, how far is the punt going to go? <laughs> I mean, it's it's nuts and it's 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 very high twitch. Um, and some of that high twitch uh, has, you know, entered the markets, you know, whether it's the meme stock trading, you know, the Robinhood platforms, um, you know, certainly AI and machine learning is being applied to markets to try to, you know, uh, figure out, um, you know, how to buzz in faster than your competitor. Uh, how to take that position in front of somebody else. Um, and so, you know, I think that there certainly are aspects of markets uh, that are much more casino-like than they were, you know, back in Warren's earlier days when, you know, he could take his time to find, you know, some inefficiency and slowly build a position before anybody knew he was doing it. But... Uh, then you have Einhorn on the other hand saying that he can't get a repricing on any of, his, any of the things that you know he used to buy at a 10 PE and get back to a 15, and now he has to buy a, a 5 PE and hope that they do buybacks. 
So on the other hand, it's like kind of inefficient in the other direction compared to what, you know, all the gambling. Yeah. Um, I, um, I leave the fundamentals to smart people like you guys and David Einhorn. Um, you know, I, I think that um, for what I'm trying to do, price is, is, you know, the arbiter. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, price is always right, <laughs> but you know, how many times have we seen price stay wrong for an enormously long period of time? Uh, you know, so, um, I, I, I think no Buffett's, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's hard to argue with uncle Warren uh, on an observation like that. Uh, you know, as our buddy, Rudy Havenstein, <laughs> I, I think just about every day he's got a post referring to the casino. <laughs> casino closed. <laughs> Jim, um, I just read Hussman's interim comment, and he's, mm. he, you know, he's bearish, but he's 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 been bearish for a while. But he seems to think that there's some like, so the reason it's an interim interim comment is because there's some very near term volatility. I think is the way that he would characterize it. Do you, uh, if you read that and you want to rush out to sort of hedge yourself or what's the sort of smart way of doing that given where the VIX is relative to the fixed futures and the options mm. and all that sort of, uh, is it, a, is it an expensive? This is not investment advice also, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, but thanks, I'm going to be writing thanks, down the answer. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Jake. I was, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. You know, um, the, the, uh, you know the, the the grail, right? Is is that convex uh, place to to be, right? Where is the convexity, and uh, and and right now the convexity is in the wings, right? If you look at measures of skew, if you look at, um, um, you know what what you know deep out of the money hedging costs. Uh, it's very low, you know, so so the answer would be, you know, as far out of the money as you can be comfortable um, and then, you know, figure out what kind of position size would achieve the objective you hope to achieve. Um, but, you know, that's that that's what I'm seeing right now is that, you know, again, the cost to hedge remains historically low um the black and swan insurance is is relatively cheap right relatively now. cheap yeah and and does that mean it's gonna you know what that means is that if if something really does rock the world um that that that's gonna have a good payoff uh the flip side is and 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 so if you're not paying a lot for that protection then you also can you know comfort yourself that you haven't you know, bet the ranch and, you know, then found out that, you know, the bet was uh, a waste of time and uh, your ranch is gone. <laughs> it's been a little while since I've lost money in the wings. So that early fun. I, I go and <laughs> throw some money away there. One, one more time for real time's time. sake. <laughs> I used to, Jake and I used to keep each other going when we were buying tail insurance and it wasn't getting paid off. We egged each other on. Thank God that finally finished. Well, never you know, got, look, didn't ever get paid. Um, as as part of my 2023 presentation, you know, I I I showed two ETFs that are designed to provide tail hedges, and I did not identify them. Um, you know, and and the purveyors of said ETFs are friends of mine, <laughs> so I didn't want to. Uh, criticized you know, by category. I didn't want to incur any more wrath than necessary, but you know, it, it's just um, it, it just goes to show that you know this is this is a hard game, um, and and you need to really kind of invest some time and effort to figure out how you want to play the game if you want to play the game, um, because again, there are a bunch of different ways. You know, if you're nervous, take some exposure off the table. 
Um, you know, that's sort of the easiest way. Now, oh, but Jim, there are tax consequences. I don't want to, you know, recognize gains. Okay, fine. You know, then, you know, sort out another way to do it, but recognize that, um, you know, they, they ain't no free lunch. It used to be uh, the damn mixed call options. The problem was they're European. So then, I mean, actually, it'd be in the money at one point, but not when it was time to close them. <laughs> yeah, I've done that a few times. <laughs> uh, right in the right. Well, in the so, so, you know, um, uh, again, not a recommendation, but, you know, there are uh, uh, pretty vibrant option chains on UVXY and VXX. You know, so if you don't like VIX options, um, then, you know, you can go to the ETFs and get similar exposure um, in options that you can close out whenever you feel like it. And and there are a lot of really smart people who are active, you know, in those option chains. Some, you know, very- That's, that's where you want to be, competing with the really smart people. <laughs> Well, or just uh, or just try to get on the horse that they're already get on. The on same and, horse. Yeah. Speaking of which, there was a there was a a trader, and I forget who used to follow this. Somebody on Twitter or Zero Hedge or someone like that used to follow the the Fiddy set. Do you remember Fiddy? He used to come in and in or I don't know, wasn't mail. Yeah, fair, well, but Fiddy's in been huge I, Fiddy's, size. Yeah, Fiddy's been identified. Uh, okay. it's it's a very large UK money manager. Um, and who, you know, gigantic equity portfolio that, you know, was uh, looking for hedges uh, here and there, uh, some of which paid off and some of which didn't. But um, do you know how they did overall in that trade? You know, I don't. I, I mean, there's there's some stuff out in the uh, uh, on the interwebs. <laughs> uh, uh, making reference to it, there are some people who've, you know, who, who suggest that they've done the math and figured out that they either made or didn't make any money. Um, but, you know, again, that's, that's a classic case where, you know, it's not some hedge fund guy speculating with, you know, long fixed call positions. It's, it's somebody hedging a portfolio just and with enough size that, you know, it, got noticed jake we had a request to repeat the name of uh the burglman was it burglman can you spell that uh yeah burglman's trap it's uh b-u-r-g-e-l-m-a-n burglman's trap thanks very much jim um we're coming up on the Coming up on full time, if uh, folks want to follow along with what you're doing or get in contact, what's the best way of doing that? The, you know, an easy way is to uh, uh, track me on X, <laughs> the Twitters, at Vixologist. Um, you can also find me, uh, you can Google Ballast Rock, B-A-L-L-A-S-T, Rock. Um in Charleston, South Carolina, there are a bunch of cobblestone streets uh, that are not cobblestones. They are rocks that came out of the old sailing ships that oh, may have been wow. may have been leaving cargo of different sorts in Charleston Harbor. Um, and and back in those days, you know, you needed to weigh down the ship if it didn't have cargo. So um, they used ballast rock that. Resembles cobblestone, but that's where our name came from. I did wonder um, about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, well, Jim Carroll, Ballast Rock, and the Vixologist on Twitter, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure. And we'll be back next week, everybody. Same 